Right, so next up we have the moment we've all been kind of waiting for. So this is uh, going to be the panel discussion where we'll have, we'll be fielding questions and stuff that you guys have been posting, hopefully. So uh, I only one more chair here for my computer. So may I invite on to stage right now uh, Rasmus Ledoff, Sebastian Berkman, and Derek Rittens. All right. Okay, so we have asked you guys to pose some questions, and these are some of the questions that everyone has been kind of asking for. This is the first uh, question up here is about. Let's flash this up there. What do you have to say to the people who demote PHP, saying? That, the PHP, that PHP is the language of the past. What do you see? How do you see PHP in the next 10 years? Loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, it's a language of the past. We've been using it for 25 years, right? Um, it doesn't mean it's any less useful. There's a reason it's stuck around for 25 years. Tools that don't work don't stick around for 25 years, right? I mean, it's just, there's just no way you would keep using a tool that didn't work for that long. Um, there's a lot of geeks, fighting geeks in the world, and everyone thinks their latest thing is the most shiny. Um, when something gets really popular, it's not cool anymore. So there's a lot of that in the PHP world. What really kind of counts is the fact that usage hasn't dropped in the 25 years. So that the absolute numbers of, of PHP servers out there has kept going up. Percentage-wise, it's, it's gone up and down a little bit, depending on which huge ISP added to the numbers. Um, but other than that, it's been a steady increase in terms of absolute numbers of, of folks using PHP. So, I mean, it, it, I'm not sure how else to answer the question. So that the market speaks for itself, right? If, if this was really sort of true, then usage should have dropped off 10 years ago, 20 years ago. I mean, it shouldn't have survived, but it does. That's really the, the only thing you can say. About the, about the language and, and sort of the ecosystem. I think a lot of it comes from the fact that, admittedly, PHP is not a very pretty language in terms of language design. But there's a hell of a lot more to solving the web problem than how pretty your syntax is. That's probably the least important. Also consider that end users, they don't give a shit how the code looks. They want the site that they're using to work. They want the product to work, right? The only people that care are the geeks arguing with each other, uh, tabs versus spaces, and useless stuff like that, which is completely irrelevant. The color of the hammer doesn't matter. It's what you build with it, right? And that's where the focus is and should be. Geeks that worry about the color of their tools um, it's, they'll always do that. They always have and they will 10 years from now. So like, part of that question is what's going to happen to PHP in 10 years from now. We'll be having the same conversation in 10 years. <laughs> right? Is PHP a language of the past? I'll get that question in 10 years. I'll probably get it in 20 years. Right? Oops. Hopefully not in 30 years because I probably won't be around anymore. Right? <laughs> but that's, that's where I see PHP in 10 years. It's this exact same question. Anyone? Okay. Sebastian? No? All right. That was an awesome answer. It will go wherever the web goes. Yeah. I mean, fashion things will come in our fashion, but it's what you use to build the tools to solve the problems that, we, that people have, right? That's more important, right? All right. Next up, we have another question here. Do you think PHP will become a system language similar to Go or Python in the future? No. 
Uh, no, I don't think so either. It's, um, I mean, I, I use it for little shell scripts here and there, but it is not on the same level as, as all the languages are made for, right? I mean, PHP's primary language is made for the web, and that's where it's good at, and that's where it will very likely stay. Uh, you want to add anything? Yeah, I agree. Next up, oh, I'm going breezing through these questions very fast. Uh, PHP uh, in the microservices and serverless space. What is the future of PHP? As in, I guess you're asking, to, we want to use something like PHP in the serverless or microservices space. Well, if the question is posed like that, then the answer is the future is in the past because PHP since the beginning was serverless. Okay. You uploaded your code somewhere onto a shared hosting thing like 20, 25 years ago and the server would run it. It's pretty much what? That's what's touted as the big advantage of serverless today. You put a function somewhere and it's run. Yeah, just upload a file and you're done. Been there, done that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you have to, guys. I guess it, it depends also a little bit on, on sort of the context of microservices. I mean, people think of PHP as big blocks of HTML coming out of it, but nothing says that PHP has to generate HTML, right? I mean, obviously it can generate JSON, XML, whatever. It's actually really, really good at generating little blobs of JSON. Um, so it, it's perfectly suited. And I've talked to some folks here. There was one that's a um, game developer that's using PHP as the back end for a mobile game, right? I mean, it's perfect for that. Let's put that is answered. And the next question, ooh, this is a, what's PHP 8 going to be like? <laughs> yeah, it, it's most definitely going to be faster. The, the, the main thing I think we have been talking about for PHP 8 is probably the JIT. Um, that's going to make some interesting things. I don't think it's going to make your standard database-driven application any faster, but it might open up the ability to write things that you might otherwise write as a PHP extension. You might be able to move some of the PHP extensions into PHP land to, and take advantage of the JIT, which will make a lot of things easier and also open up essentially extension development to people who aren't necessarily very good at C. Um, the other thing we have been discussing is a bit of um, non-blocking I.O. and async. Um, there's some talk around fibers, if you're familiar with that concept. But I mean, it's, it's still a couple of years away, at least two years away from PHP 8, probably more like three, but we'll see. Um, but those, those are the main sort of big things, the JIT, fibers, I.O improvements are the, are the main things I see. I, I think syntax-wise, what is pretty high on people's wish list is things like generated and stuff, or generic, sorry, um, which I, know. I, I, I don't care much about, but other people seem to, so. As of last night, the only thing syntax-wise that I'm missing is typed arrays. I don't really need generics. I want typed arrays, but that's All right, let's mark that as answered, and ooh, this is going to be interesting. What actually happened to PHP 6? Oh, oh my. <laughs> Do you want a short answer or a long answer? The funny answer. The, sh the short and funny answer is book publishers. Book publishers, why? Because they're stupid. So I have to explain that. So a friend of mine, a friend of ours actually, one day got a package in the mail from a book publisher. It was a new edition of her book that she wrote and she didn't know anything about the new book. Her name was on the top of the, of, of the cover and the book title was PHP 6 and MySQL 6. So there is no PHP 6, there is no MySQL 6. 
somehow the book publisher thought, okay, the PHP project is talking about PHP 6. We need to update our book. So at a time, like, when was that? Around 2004, 2006. That was the time. 2006, uh, we released PHP 5.3. So at some point before that. Something like that? Yeah, long ago. Remember, we are old, we forget things. Um, so around that time, PHP 6 was discussed, was being worked on, and she got the book in the mail saying, hey, PHP 6, MySQL 6. So what happened? The book publisher thought, okay, they're talking about PHP 6. We need a new version of the book. They did a search and replace and replaced PHP 5 with PHP 6 and MySQL 5 with MySQL 6. To get a new ISBN, it's a new publication. They get new sales and at some point, we scrapped the PHP 6 project. That's what uh, Rasmus and, uh, and Derek can talk about uh, a little bit. But when PHP 7 was on the horizon, we needed to find out what version number to give this new major update to the PHP language. Um, and we quickly came to the conclusion that there are more than one, there's more than one book out there that has PHP 6 in the title and talks about PHP 6. And it would be really, really, really confusing to everybody who learns about PHP from a book if we would now release something ten, or 10 plus years later, call it PHP 6, and people go to these books and the books don't match what the reality is. So that was the slightly longer, but I think still funny answer. And now for the technical details, I'll <laughs> hand it off. Uh, well, the PHP 6 project was primarily focused about having Unicode strings in the engine that requires a lot of work. And most of that work was done. But the main issue is probably that it impacted performance, anything string related significantly, um, more so with the amount of memory being used. And there was the, the last 10% of the implementation was going to be so hard to do correctly without impacting performance a lot. And by a lot, it, it used nearly twice as much as memory. And I mean, things like WordPress were like 80 or 90% slower, if I remember correctly. And because of that, it, it, releasing that as a project would not have been a good thing. And more and more people were thinking about, well, maybe we should reconsider how we do strings in PHP and Unicode anyway. So time was spent on working on the Intel extension to do all this uh, localized language support for it. And uh, that then got released as PHP 5.3 ish, I think, uh, which had much of the same features. So the only thing I, I can think that we would go back to doing Unicode support would not have it support in the engine on, like having to support, change every function that deals with strings to also understand this Unicode type besides the current strings, the Booleans, the whatever types we have, is by having some kind of Unicode string class or object that you can do manipulations on and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, uh, project-wise, it ended up being a dead end in the end. I mean, we spent how much time on it? Two and a half years or something like that? Um, I mean, a lot of the Intel, sorry, I mean, we learned a lot about the, the Intel stuff and the Intel extension. Uh, it's, it's some of the work, at least. I, I wouldn't say it's all lost um, because a lot of that knowledge and work went into the Intel extension, which wouldn't have existed. But I mean, so that's what we have left from PHP 6 is that Intel extension um, that lots of people use today because we learned a lot about ICU through, through that, way too much actually. And yeah, it was, it was, I mean, it was a bad decision to go down that route because it was just too much. It was way more effort than we had thought and it became way more complicated than we had thought and developers working on the PHP project were lost and that's bad. So we had to take smaller steps and like move most of the work into the extension and then some of the other things that had been waiting, we sort of, when, once we killed PHP 6, the developers came back because then now they had a way of sort of in a small incremental step get their changes into PHP in a reasonable timeline which just wasn't happening with the PHP 6 effort. Everything was dragging on too long and people were losing interest in contributing and that's a bad, bad thing for an open source project.
Yeah, so all the things that could have gone into PHP 6 basically were backported into 5.3, 5, 5.4, 5, and all that. Kind of, kind of. Not all of them. All right. So that's OK. Next, let's talk about what are some things you regret in PHP? If you had to do it again, what would you change? Oh, I'll create create without the E at the end. I know, I was <laughs> trying to make a joke. Now, what I would do differently, uh, I think if, I think we would be better naming our standard functions more consistently. It, that means if we have to start PHP from scratch right now, I'm not advocating that we'd ever change that. I think that'd be one thing. I think it would have been OO from the start, probably. Yeah, that, that was hard to do in 93. No, I understand that. But we're now about 25 years later, so <laughs> now that would probably have been done. Um, but yeah, that's regret. All the regrets. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the, 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 the daytime extension would have had the daytime class being immutable by default. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I can think of. I regret advocating adding to PHP 5's object model back in the day uh, to have the underscore underscore get set call and that all those magic interceptors. They work so nicely in small talk where I came across the concept, but I didn't imagine how many people would ab uh, abuse that to write code that nobody can understand, neither the, ex neither the IDE nor static analysis tools nor the developers working on the code had I known that, but I was young and naive at the time, and I c was able to convince Marcus and others to implement that. Rasmus, anything from you? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have a few things I would have done, well, I have a long list of things I would have done differently if I had known that 25 years later people would be asking me about it, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> A, a lot. <laughs> probably not. I, I probably wouldn't have. So he was asking me, would I still have even started the project if I had known that 25 years later I'm still talking about the same damn piece of code, which isn't the same code anymore, but it's, it's sort of conceptually the same piece of code. I, I probably wouldn't. This was never intended to be this 25-year project. It was just a little hack. It was my hack for me to build web pages really, really quickly for the various clients I was doing web consulting for at the time. Right? This wasn't for you, it was for me. Um, just kind of turned out to be useful to other people. But yeah, there was tons of little hacks that I put in just because I was lazy and it solved the problem. Um, I mean, there's certain things like naming safe mode, safe mode. Right? You never want to name something safe. Because right? once you name something safe, then all the hackers attack it and prove that it's or not safe. safe. <laughs> or simple, yeah. Anything, you don't call something simple either because it, it, it ends up inevitably becoming complex. Right? Our simple, simple XML, XML isn't very yeah. simple if you look at the code. Right? Um, there's, there's all kinds of things. I mean, I did so many stupid things in the early versions of PHP. Right? My, my hashing algorithm was stringling. For, for like hashing, so you had a name of a function, right? And in order to find it in my list of functions, and back then I only had like 12 functions in the first version, and I just gave them all different lengths so I could simply do a string length, like the fastest hashing algorithm ever. Um, but I still, I, at least I had the foresight to say, I was, I'm probably going to add more, so let's at least have a hash lookup and then a linked list on each hash um, field, right? And yeah, so I would, I would rename functions so that they would be evenly distributed across the various lengths. So HTML special chars is really long because I didn't want it to conflict with a whole bunch of others because I was going to call it quite a bit. So I made it long so it would have, it own, have its own hash slot. Um, and a lot of those names have stuck. Obviously, we don't hash with stringling anymore because we have so many functions in the global symbol table. Um, but still, the, the names have stuck. Um, other things, case sensitivity on, on, on the various symbols. Back then I didn't want to get into the whole fight of whether HTML should be uppercase or lowercase or mixed case. That was actually a big discussion in the mid and uh, early 90s. So PHP functions, function calls can be either 
uppercase, lowercase, or a mixed case, right? You can put whatever case you want on them, which, I mean, if I could take that back. I, really, I, I thought about changing that in, I think, 96 or something, but I looked, oh man, look how many users I have. There are thousands of people that would be impacted by this, and I didn't do it, right? And now, there are millions of people. <laughs> if I could get away with just screwing over a couple of thousand people, perfect, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, but nowadays we have tools like PHP CS Fixer who would fix that in like a second. Yeah, but if you don't pay attention, you have to learn the hard way. <laughs> you wouldn't upgrade anyway. Yes, so, so most of my regrets revolve around PHP unit, but that's what I'm talking about tomorrow morning. <laughs> Good way to talk about your, your talk tomorrow. That's awesome. Let's mark that as answered. Next one up. What is your advice to people who are using PHP in their daily work? What are the do's and don'ts? Use an IDE that is actually an IDE. <laughs> <laughs> like ev ev every week I work with a different team and like once a month I work with a team when not everyone is using uh, PHP Storm. And I see those people and they, they struggle for things that the colleagues need seconds or milliseconds to figure out. They take minutes or sometimes half an hour to, to, to find something in their code base. Don't do that to yourself. If you spend a lot of time and know what you're doing, yes, you can achieve the same thing with Vim or Emacs or whatever, but be nice to yourself and use a tool that actually supports you. And no, I'm not paid to say that, <laughs> um, which is not entirely true because I also don't pay for PHP Storm. They don't want my money. I tried. They refunded it because I helped them a couple of times over the years. Um, yeah. And you, in ge talking more broadly, you look at tools. Look at tools that can help you. Things like PHP CS Fixer nowadays can make changes to your entire code base uh, in a reliable way. So if you need to update <coughs> uh, a coding style or, or a coding convention, that's, that's really simple. Use static analysis tools like the one like Fan or Psalm to find issues in your code. Know about these tools. They make you more productive. Yeah, and there's and there's so many of them, right? Uh, I mean, I learned about PHP Spy today. Uh, I'm mo mostly interested to figure out how it works because I don't write PHP code anymore. But uh, it's it's yeah. I mean, it, uh, use a proper debugger if you need it. I mean, you don't need it for every time. But if you really need a good debugger, then please use a debugger. Um, yeah, it's all the tools. May, try to find out, figure out what else there is besides just writing the code that can help you doing things better. And I'm sure there's plenty of things to find there. Um, on a slightly different note on that, if you're working with PHP every day and you have a team of PHP developers, please, if you're more experienced, mentor the younger folks, the less experienced. Get them up to speed. Don't assume that they'll figure stuff out on their own. Um, everyone is better off if, if the whole team learns. And I, I have come across some teams where there's not a lot of mentorship going on. There's a lot of criticism and in code reviews, very negative. Um, try to be a little bit more empathetic and help out the junior developers. Everyone was new at some point. Give them a hand. All right. Let's mark this answered. And the next one we have is... This is tricky. They all have seven votes. Uh, let's look for this one. Is it coming up? Uh, did my internet die? Answer. Okay, let's see. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, this this one. This one I'm interested in. 
Are there any interesting stories about how PHP has, has had to hand, maintain backward compatibility because it's so popular? I don't remember any funny stories, but it's, they're mostly <laughs> sad stories. <laughs> but, but it does sometimes mean that decisions have to be taken because we don't want to break or make all the things ambiguous again, right? I mean, maybe a well-known one is the namespace separator, which not everybody's particularly happy about, but it's the on only way that really sort of fits, otherwise we would end up breaking some other code at some point or make other code more ambiguous. That's the one I can remember. Do you know any s sadder stories? <laughs> You think, you think the namespace separator is the saddest no, one? <laughs> I, I mean, there's been tons of things over the years that, I mean, not changing the, like, I talked about not changing the case stuff, right? I mean, that would have been a good thing to change, but it was all about backward compatibility. It's, argument, it, order. argument order as well, obviously, obviously we could go back and fix it. Um, but not without making life really, really painful for folks trying to upgrade. And we have really focused hard over the years on making it easy to upgrade to a newer version. Or at least, not, it's never easy. Especially if you leave it for 10 plus years and you have to go from like PHP 5.3 to, to 7.2 or something. That's, that's hard. But if you, every two to three years, if you have a look at upgrading your stack, it's not that bad. Each incremental 7.x release. It's pretty small. You can run it, fix a couple of things, run fan, run some of the tools, and you can upgrade a large code base in an afternoon. If it isn't 10 years old, right? So yeah, I mean, maintaining that over the years, we have had to make a lot of concessions, and we have to leave mistakes in the code for a very long time and put in deprecation notices for years and years and years. And then after like 10 years of you seeing these damn depreca deprecation warnings, finally we removed the feature and then people start screaming because they didn't know they were going away. It's like, what the hell? Your code has been sh showing you warnings for 10 years and you didn't notice? You never ever checked your error log? No, I'm like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I know. Sebastian is more on the sort of side of just break everything. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> so I definitely don't want to break um, every people's code. Like just the people who don't pay attention. <laughs> if if you don't pay attention for ten years, then yeah. I mean, I, I have similar issues uh, in in the PHP Unit project. Like last year in February, when PHP Unit six came out. Within an hour after I released PHP Unit 6.0.0, I got hundreds of Twitter responses, emails, uh, dozens of tickets saying this doesn't work anymore. Bec and wh what happened? PHP Unit 6 required PHP 7. Um, and, well, yeah. And also cha finally changed uh, the namespaces from, uh, you, to use namespaces. And people that complained had star as the version constraint in the composer JSON. <laughs> and for a year before, like with every release, with and every new, uh, tweet, like, okay, next year this is going to happen. Nobody listens. Well, not all of them listen. You can't reach all of them. Right. And but eventually it will break for them. Yeah, and I, I, I recognize that people who don't pay attention, but those are also the types of people that we really need to help. And we, we don't want to make it impossible. We don't want to, we, we don't want to lose that, right? That's, we don't want to do a Perl 6 but type it's, it's thing, It's like right? the, the deprecation of records to globals, right? If yeah. we really wanted to, we probably would have wanted to do it much faster, but that would have been a disaster. It could break people's code and, and yeah, and, and mm -hmm. introduce security holes and stuff like that. There's so much stuff that you need to think about sometimes, right? All right. Next one. All right. Let's mark this answer. This is going to be a little bit controversial, but I hope you guys can bear with me here. Did Hacklang make PHP better? Uh, I mean, if you if you're saying Hacklang as sort of uh, 
more detailed. We were getting, we weren't focusing very much on performance. One of the reasons being that people at the time were using really, really slow frameworks that did horrendously slow things, which basically sent the message to us is that, well, people don't care how slow their PHP code is because we have made PHP decently fast and then you layer on top these really heavy, really slow frameworks that slow it down by a factor of 10 and people are still using it. It's like, what the hell? Um, which is a bad reason for not caring that much about performance, but we weren't getting the real message from people that performance was sort of the number one issue that people were having with PHP. Then HHVM came along and suddenly, they did, HHVM did two things. First, it showed that this could be done faster and by the reaction from the community, we also saw that people were very, very interested in a much faster PHP, which is kind of an obvious thing, right? But we didn't really see that people were having performance issues with PHP 5. That was, it tended to not be the thing that people were complaining about. But by then having the option of a much faster PHP, then suddenly that came back on the radar for the community and for us as developers as well. Um, so that's when the focus shifted. So one of the things that it did was to help us change the focus a little bit and really focus on making a version of PHP that was dramatically faster than what we had at the time. There are also various features that kind of sort of were borrowed from HHVM, but they also kind of sort of borrowed it from PHP. It, there, there was a lot of ideas flowing back and forth between the two teams. Um, so, so there's some RFCs that have been sitting around in the PHP side of things um, ended up in HHVM. Um, and additionally, it made a formal language uh, specification. Oh, yeah. That's true, right. The, lang the language spec came out of the HHVM project in the sense that they hired a professional writer to sit down and write a language spec for PHP, which would help them maintain compatibility with PHP. Because Facebook had asked, hey, do you have a spec for the language itself? It's like, no. It's like, okay. And they, they're, they were big and have lots of money, so they threw money at that and hired someone to sit down, study PHP, and write a language spec for it, which, which was a really cool thing to come out of it. And now when Facebook has announced they're no longer going to <laughs> maintain compatibility with PHP, that whole language spec is completely useless to them but it's still super useful to us and we're still maintaining it and updating it. Yeah, well they officially announced it about a few months ago, but unofficially it's been happening for a whole lot longer right. than that. Okay, that's Mark that's answered. All right, next one, let's see. What's another la uh, programming language that you really like? What do you like about it? Well, I do most of my programming in C. Um, so but what do you like about it? I, I like C. I like that it's fast. I like that it does exactly what I tell it to. Um, I like it how it crashes my stuff fast. And yeah, it I, I mean, yes, if you, if you tell it to do the wrong things, it'll crash on you. Um, but Valgrind and the various tools around C are pretty mature. So I, I like it as a language, but also because the whole stack. I mean, if you don't know C, then I don't really trust you as a low-level developer because everything below your application is written in C, all the way down to the device drivers and the kernel and everything. So if you don't know your way around C, I don't really see how you can be sort of a full-stack developer. You, you can write apps in PHP, obviously. You can write lots and lots of cool things. But if you're a large company, you need to have a C hacker in, on the team because when things go really wrong, you need to go down into the C level. You need to understand what the hell is going on. So in that sense, I, I don't like it as a language, but I like it as a, as a critical tool to understand what the hell is happening on your computer. And it's, I think that's impossible to do without understanding C well. Yeah, but I, I would agree there. I spend most of my time in C as well. The only PHP code I, code I write is our tests, uh, which aren't particularly interesting bits of PHP. 
but um, I, I really I think like Auk as well, by the way. Oh, I think Auk is cool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe I'm showing my age. But <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> no, I mean, as long as you don't say Atlan, I, I guess I'm fine. But um, yeah, see, for me, I think it's it's it, it's, it's a very dirty language, and it, you 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 need to be friends with it for 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 to do things for you and not be angry at you all the time. Um, but yeah, know, knowing the basics of computing, I think, is useful in general. Um, even if you write, if, even if you only write front-end React JS stuff, right? Uh, all the concepts are still coming down from the lower languages. And once you start knowing a bit about C, you know how computers do with memory management and things like that. And uh, I, I think these are still useful skills, even if you'd only ever write PHP applications. Or knowing a little bit of assembly is also kind of useful, even if you're writing PHP because its internal language is vaguely similar to that as well. Right? So you can withdraw, so you can make some of the connections between them. Yeah. So two C's and a. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're going to say. Sebastian's the only PHP developer <laughs> up here. <laughs> so. <laughs> so yeah, almost all the code that I write these days and have been writing for the last 20 years is PHP. Um, when I'm not doing PHP, when I'm doing hobby stuff, then it's assembly on the Motorola 68K. <laughs> uh, a little bit of C once in a while on the Amiga. But they're not asking you what you're using. They're asking you what you like, right? Yeah, they ask me what I like. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like assembly on the Amiga. Really? Right. Yeah, writing okay. at the right address in memory to put a pixel on the screen. That's kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> so this was a bad audience to ask this question to. Yeah. We have three really old geeks, yeah. right? So, <laughs> so, we're, so we're, we're living in the past. So. Yeah, if I'm not allowed to talk about dead languages, then what from the newer languages that have come up over the last couple of years, I think Rust is the most interesting to me. Mm. Um, when Go came along, I understood what uh, they wanted to do with that, like basically a cleaned up modernized C, but it didn't really appeal to me. But Rust, I can, can understand because it eliminates a whole array of potential bugs and security issues on the compiler level. And I think that's kind of valuable. And to, to, um, just to underline what uh, both Rasmus and Derek said, um, it scares me that these days people that start programming don't learn C or assembly and have no idea how the computer works. I mean, Back when I started, back when we started programming, computers were so simple that if you wanted, you could understand every single bit of hardware in your machine. That's not possible these days anymore. I mean, for, for, for hobbyist stuff, I still use my Amiga. It's still running. And back, back then, I knew what each of the chips did and how it worked internally, and I was able to do that. Uh, to work with that, but I forgot all of that, most of that. I'm relearning that. But nowadays, I wouldn't even try to figure out how my CPU works on the lowest level. And turns out, the people that design these things also don't know how they work. Um, so I'm really happy that I have at least one CPU in my household that is not affected by Spectre. Um, I think you're getting off topic here. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's my best answer. Next, let's take a, take a little different approach to this. Um, let's see. Right, this one. How should a student dive into learning and contributing to the world of PHP? So, contributing to the world of PHP. Well, I mean, figure out what interests you. Figure out that the, the, this little slice of PHP that you would like to affect. Right? And dive in. Um, I mean, some people say start with documentation. Like, no, if you're a developer, don't start with the documentation. Just start by developing. Um, maybe by fixing bugs. I mean, it's a good way of learning something. The things I know the most about are the things that break a lot, right? 
because if it breaks all the time, I have to figure out why the hell did it break, and I'm debugging it and really learning how it works in order to fix it. The things that never break, I don't even know how it works. I'm just glad it does because I don't have to fix it, right? So by fixing bugs, it's a really good way of tracing through, figuring out why is this not giving me the answer that I'm expecting? And you learn a lot about the system that way. So you can go on the PHP bug tracker, bugs.php.net. There's a little random button, top right, that'll give you a random bug. And keep hitting that until you get something that looks interesting to fix. Uh, and then dive in and fix it. Uh, yes, there are plenty to choose from. <laughs> Maybe you should introduce the concept of code sprints at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was exactly like that until I tried it. So since last year, I've do, I'm doing biannual code sprints for PHP unit where the focus is coaching people that want to contribute but don't know where to start. And they come with issues or they look at the issue tracker, they find something that interests them and they dive in and I'm around trying to help them work on the issue that they're interested in. I, th I think that's hard to do in sort of a distributed remote setting. I think a, a user group with one really experienced developer mm -hmm. and getting people in the room and then maybe taking a bug yeah. um, and the experienced developer yep. will go through the bug in front of a, a small group of people in the user group. Makes and sense. Something like that because I think it's hard to coach remotely when you don't see the the struggle and you don't see mm -hmm. the pain right in front of you because people aren't, it's hard to communicate that I think. Yeah. So I, I think that might be a good idea for user groups is to have some code sprint sessions or like debugging sessions where you debug a really hard problem um, and then have, have someone actually go through and then show how do we debug this, what are the tools we can use and show the, the process. Okay, this mark that is answered, and this next one I might be of interest to you guys. Any advice to young PHP developers coming through, given how big the, the PHP world is uh, in terms of frameworks, CMS, tools, and so on and so forth? Any advice for young de PHP developers coming through? I'm not a PHP developer that's, that can answer that, really. I'm a C guy. <laughs> I think Sebastian is the only one here. <laughs> I would say learn the language, understand the language, and start from there. Uh, don't try to be just a Drupal developer, WordPress developer, Symfony developer, whatever developer. Don't box yourself into that thing. I mean, don't get me wrong, all of these things have their, the, the reason to exist and um, help a lot of people. But I think the most useful thing is you need to understand the language. And even if you, so I, I meet a lot of people that say, yeah, I do not really know, need to know how, how PHP works and what the PHP language is um, because I am just a XYZ developer and only need to know what little PHP I need to write my extension for framework XYZ or, or whatever, but sooner or later you need to understand the code of what you're using and what you're integrating with. Let's switch back to something more closer to the internals. Let's see this one. How about this one? While PHP is raiding in the web kingdom, should it start to venture into the data science arena and create new functionalities that allow for more heavy, uh, heavy duty data processing and math calculations? Well, we, we might get a bit of that in PHP 8 with the JIT. Um, w without the JIT, it's going to be too slow to do that in, uh, in the scripting what, language. That's well, data processing is more, well, depends. How, Depends what kind of processing. If you're doing a lot of processing in memory, the JIT can help a yeah. lot. Um, for those who don't know, I get, I'm just sort of throwing the JIT out there. Um, JIT is a just-in-time compiler that really helps with hot spots in your code. So if you have a, a very tight loop that's sitting there executing some code a lot, then the JIT can optimize that. You can recognize that hot spot in the code 
and optimize the hell out of just that little bit of code. Um, so if you're generating, say, a fractal with PHP, so highly recursive that's sitting there in the main fractal generation loop, um, that's going to run probably an order of magnitude faster with a JIT. Whereas your WordPress site won't speed up at all because that's going through all kinds of different parts of the WordPress code and talking to databases and things and the JIT doesn't improve that kind of code at all. The, the extension that I'm sh showing or working on in a workshop on Saturday is a very good example of that because it's a highly memory CPU kind of algorithm that you're going to rewrite in C or wrap in C really uh, where that would be very useful to have and then not having to write it in C. Right. So that's faster. So the real answer, I mean, the answer to the question is we're not going to, we're not really going to focus outside of the web very much, but the, the language itself is evolving and the optimization is evolving to the point where writing code like that is probably going to improve in the next couple of years. It's not short term though, you, you, you're not going to see it next year in PHP 7.4 if we have a 7.4. It's going to be two to three years out. Right. And the next one is back to something, some legacy stuff. We're using legacy PHP 5. Any tips or advice on how to transition from legacy monolith to, to move to latest PHP versions? Um, yeah, I mean, I've been upgrading sites for folks are helping them upgrade and I upgraded Etsy which is a big big legacy site a couple of million lines of PHP code that started 13 14 years ago um, the company and the code is originally written by someone who really wasn't a developer but had lots of good ideas and uh, that has been challenging but it's not impossible to do, even the really, really old code. I mean, you start it by fixing your tests a little bit, so you have some confidence in your tests that if the tests pass, at least most of your application is going to work. If you have zero tests, that's probably step one. Write some tests so that you can change things and have some confidence that everything isn't broken. Step two is Simply set up a dev environment and see what breaks. See the notices. If you're really far behind, someone asked me today, they're on PHP 5.3 and they'd like to get to 7.2 or 7.3 when it comes out. And jumping from 5.3 to 7.3, uh, that's rough. I would suggest if you're in that boat, maybe jump to 5.6 initially and just do the, the smaller work to get to 5.6. Get that running reliably fix up your tests and start fixing the notices and warnings about deprecated features that PHP 5.6 spews at you. <laughs> if you have decently clean PHP 5.6 code running, the jump to PHP 7 is pretty easy. It's probably a little less actually. I think the upgrade from, I think from 5.3 to 5.5 is where the real, the real issues are. Yeah. But I, I still think Doing it in two sure. hops is probably yeah. easier because it's, it's, it's a little bit less daunting yeah. to do it that way. So that's what I would suggest. Yes, PHP 5.6 is old, but if you can get to there and you can clean up your code, if you're already on 5.6, then your first step is to clean it up so it runs clean on 5.6 so that it doesn't spew a billion notices and warnings at you in your error log. If you don't have your error log turned on, turn it on, then that's step zero. Mm -hmm. Turn on all warnings and errors set your error reporting level to negative one, which turns everything on, and see how much crap it's spewing at you. And then systematically fix those warnings so that you have a clean 5.6 run. From clean 5.6 to 7, pretty easy to do. I'm sorry. All right, and this next one is what changes across the PHP community you would like to see? How can we as developers help? Uh, 
uh, well, if you live in a place where there's no commun organized community or user group, start one. Uh, if they already exist, uh, they might not necessarily have to be PHP specific ones, they sometimes are. Web development, meetups, and things like that. Uh, join these, uh, grow them, uh, invite your friends, your coworkers along to these. Um, I also think it's important to not, if, to not stick to just a framework specific meetup if you're doing that. Uh, I sort of forgot the question now. Well, they're, they're asking about changes across the community. Yeah, so one of, the, uh, one of the changes there is that I see, have seen in the last maybe year or two that uh, the WordPress, the D Drupal, the Laravel communities are reaching out more to just be on their little pro projects. So I say little projects, that's not what I meant. To just be on their own user group and start reaching out to, to the wider PHP community and even uh, between the different frameworks, which I think has been a good change. And I think more of that can and is probably going to be done anyway. Uh, beyond that, I'm not sure what I else I can say. I would like to see a bit more diversity um, across the community. And like I mentioned before, a little bit more mentorship. And that's what ex the existing developers can do is go to your user group if there is one and share what you've learned. Um, share how to debug. Share your, your tools and your ideas. And, and your experience with others that are interested. Um, it's still a very white male dominated. I mean, I'd like to see this panel not be three old guys, all right? Next time we have this, I'd like to see that improve. So this next question is going to be kind of interesting. Okay, so the question is asking about, are you afraid that new developers are not joining internals? Um, which I think, how many of you guys know how PHP is being released and how the internals workflow kind of work? No, are you familiar? No, maybe it could, uh, <laughs> would you like to give an overview of how, how that works, how, does, how, how is the process of releasing a PHP version and all that stuff? I'll, I'll give that a shot. Um, internals is, PHP's internals aren't very simple and it requires a little bit of learning before you can start doing something with that. Uh, one of these things might be looking at bugs, as Basma's already uh, alluded to earlier. Um, but I wouldn't say that we don't get new people to work on things. I think the amount of younger people is about the same as the amount of older people if you look at the amount of work being done, Ex for the exception maybe Dimitri, because you've got a Nikita, Joe, that did, does do quite a lot, um, and there's a few more, right, that do that. It is too few people, that is definitely sure. Um, as to how new things are added to PHP, there since three years or four years, so we have a much more formal process. Where is it longer? Time flies when you're getting old. Okay, that's f f six years or whatever. See, time flies. What can I say? Uh, so there's been a much more formal process of 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 proposing new features and then working with other people to co to improve your proposal. We call them RFCs. Um, hopefully with a patch, uh, but that is not necessarily always necessary. But this, this process makes it a lot more transparent of what goes on and what gets added and not people just commit random features in the middle of the night just before release anymore, because we have had plenty of that happening, uh, especially in the early years. So on that side of contributing to PHP has gotten a little bit more organized and I think that is a good thing. And I think then at some point that would make that makes it actually easier to start contributing to it because there's a, a more guided way of, of getting started. Right. First coming up with a good idea and then hash it out with some other people and then come up with a patch and then iterate over the patches for for these new features and then have Dimitri rant about that as making everything really slow and then he re rewrites it all for you, which is great. Um, but yeah, no, I don't complain about it. I think it's amazing. Um, but uh, yeah, but yeah, having more 
people, more younger people interested in improving PHP on that level would be really, really helpful. Uh, how we get people to do that, it's difficult to say, but... The, the barrier of entry to working on like the real core internals is pretty high. And it's much, and it's much high, sorry, I'll grab the other one. And it's much higher now than I would say it was 20 years ago. Of course. Because the engine then I pretty much understood very, very well. <laughs> Whereas yes. now, like, what happens here, right? It's, and I've been trying to get very up to date with it and still, still missing things. The, there's a lot of really complicated code in the core of PHP now. I mean, just the fact that PHP suddenly became twice as fast, or maybe even more than twice as fast, without changing anything, that is serious magic. I mean, imagine taking some code that you have been working on for 20 years, and then suddenly say, okay, I'm going to make it twice as fast, right? Without losing anything. And actually, the number of instructions, if you look at the actual um, instructions generated by the compiler, it actually, from PHP 5 to PHP 7, it deleted two-thirds of them. It does the same thing in one-third the amount of instructions that we did before. So it's like saying, hey, we're going to take this code you've been working on for 20 years, we're going to delete two out of every three lines of code throughout the code and nothing can break. The amount of magic required to do this is serious, serious magic. And then coming in 25 years into this project and trying to understand all that magic, that's where the barrier of entry is really, really high. Um, I have to say one thing though. All those changes are much better documented now than under 10 or 15 years ago, <laughs> and which is really helpful, yeah, especially right. when you work on things like XDBook. Where yeah, I know. Well, that's Derek saying that I didn't document anything. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> it was no, all in my head. <laughs> no, no, the, 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 well, yeah, yes, but that's not what I was trying to say, uh, because. I would say if you look at the first 10 years, it was still easy enough yes. to be able to reverse engineer it. Yeah. And now that is no longer possible. Yeah. Now you do need documentation it, to go with it. It's like any other 25-year-old technology, right? The very first cars, or the, just compare a car 25 years ago to now. A 25-year-old car, you can figure out each component and you can figure out what it does, you can fix it. Now, no way. Any modern car is really, really complicated. You have to plug in an analyzer and really know what you're doing to fix anything. Um, and the, I mean, my car now, it doesn't even have an engine or anything, right? It's, it's an electric car that is completely different. All the rules have changed. So everything I know about fixing a car doesn't apply to my car anymore. Yeah, and you can't use a hammer anymore. No. <laughs> can't use any of the things that I know. Um, so yeah, the barrier of entry isn't just, I mean, there's a little bit of an insinuation here is that it's not a friendly community to join and contribute to. Part of that is that it's really, really hard, this stuff. So it's sort of self-selecting. There are only so many Nikitas out there that can just sort of see this stuff and can sort of, I don't know, he must spend an amazing amount of time reading through code. Um, or maybe he just has this capacity in his head to, to understand things so quickly. Because when he started contributing, he was 16, 17 in that range. And he was like, at 16 or 17, he knew everything about the internals of PHP. Yeah, which I was, ask him stuff now. Yeah, no, I, I do too. I have, he explains stuff to me every now and then that I have no idea how it works, but he does. And that's cool. We need more Nikitas. Yep. Nope. <laughs> so, in line with that question, I'm, I'm going to ask something about uh, how did you guys get involved in this in the first place? How, I mean, how did you, let's see, what's that question? Well, you know my story, so. Well, yeah. Um, I, I think it's more for these okay, two guys. Okay, I'll go first then. So, which year was it? 1999, maybe 2000, one of them. I was in, uh, in, in uni and me and two of my classmates, we started uh, writing websites for people. And back then, uh, Flash was really an important thing. So, 
we, we had this application for this customer where it read some things from the database. It's standard PHP MySQL so that people are starting to use PHP and MySQL for. But I got into contributing it because what I wanted to do is, is center this shockwave flash film in the middle of the screen. And the only way I can do that is by knowing how big it is. Right? You need to know what the size of it is. Now, PHP already had a get image size function back then, or image get size. I don't even remember what the name of the function is. But it didn't support shockwave flash. It did only BMP and J JPEG and, and PNGs and GIFs, maybe. So, well, I looked into the SWF specification and figured out, well, the size is in the first 16 bytes of the header and then added as a function to PHP. And that was, my, I think, my first contribution to it then. My second one, was, second one was a little bit more silly as a thing to do. This is when MySQL didn't do subqueries yet. So I tried, maybe I should emulate that in C code and do something like that. Uh, that did not get anywhere in the end because it's a really stupid idea. So I'm happy that it didn't make it into PHP. And then my first extension was the mcrypt extension that I rewrote because the library ver versions changed API. And this is maybe 2000, 2001. Uh, and then I started with Xdebug in 2002, I think. Yeah. And then since then, I've been uh, contributing a lot for some time and then now a lot, of, now a lot less because uh, I have other things to do then. And sit at home on my computer every evening to work on PHP code now. But uh, yeah, that's how it got started for me. So shortly after I started using PHP, I went onto the German PHP mailing list, asked some stupid questions there. And the really bad thing is that all of this is archived. The internet never forgets. <laughs> Um, but after a couple of weeks more, I started answering questions that other people had there, helped out, and eventually I asked a question and I was uh, told, yeah, you, you don't want to get an answer here, go to, the, uh, go to the English mailing list, and from there I went, went on to the internals mailing list, asked questions there. Um, at some point, I, I don't remember how that happened. I started translating the documentation from English to German. Then I contributed to the English uh, documentation. At some point, I found the bug, at which point I realized that PHP is written in C. <laughs> it took a while. <laughs> took a while, yeah. Like, I don't know, we were talking about three, four months at that point. Three and three uh, Yeah. And uh, so I l looked in there. I never had done any C development outside of the Amiga. Like, Literally, um, I was, my, my, that was my only computer until 98. I got my first x86 machine in 98, and a couple of months later, I discovered PHP. So I um, hadn't done any C development on, on, on x86 on Linux. Um, so I needed to figure out what the tool chain is, and eventually got around to fix the bug, and somehow ended up fixing mostly Windows build-related stuff for the next one or two years until the build system was cleaned up for Windows. And yeah, around that time, um, discussions were happening for, for what PHP 5 might be. And I remember discussing a lot of stuff like the, the, the object model, reflection API, uh, things like the interceptors I mentioned earlier, and basically discussed features and then tested them a lot. When did you start with PHP Unit? I started with PHP Unit, depending on how you count. I published, the first, I published it for the first time in, in 2001, end of 2001, early 2002. I had it on, on my computer at least a half a year before I published that. That was the proof of concept I created as a bet with my professor. But I wanted to clean that up, and then I wanted to upload that to SourceForge, but there was already a PHP unit on SourceForge, and I couldn't create a new project on SourceForge. Um, that guy never re uh, replied to my emails, so eventually I did something really sneaky and just put it into the new repository on cvs.php.net that Steek had created called Pear. And that's where it lived for a couple of years. It's rather sneaky. <laughs> cool. Let's. And this will probably will be the last question for the for the day. I think we are very tired, but this is forward-looking. 
If you had limitless resources, time, and budget, what would be the three features you would like to add to PHP? Maybe not three, la, two, la, one or two. I mean, I think a, an amazing JIT would be the main thing. It's really, really hard to write even a bad JIT. Um, writing a good JIT is almost impossible. Um, Facebook showed what you could do if you had basically, they have unlimited resources. They threw a team of like, I think 30 at this problem. I mean, if you can throw 30 compiler gurus at a problem, you can solve pretty much anything. One thing that most people don't know is that the number of people actually working on the core of PHP is really, really small. We have like two people who are really working on it, um, and then a couple of halves, and then a lot of people sort of floating around the outside, contributing a little bit every now and then. But really, Nikita and Dimitri are doing the bulk of the work uh, on that. Like maybe a dozen or 20 people that commit things on a monthly basis, something like that? Yeah. But I mean, the, the team at, at the core is really, really small. Um, and the amount of sites and companies around the world that depend on these two people is pretty amazing. And the amount of stuff we can do with such a small set of, of hardcore people is, is amazing, right? If we had, if we could multiply Dimitri and Nikita by 10, which is what Facebook was able to do, um, that would be amazing. The, the, the amount of stuff that could come out of that. Of, of course, I mean, just adding more people isn't necessarily going to help that much. Um, but having more Nikitas, I don't know. With unlimited but what resources. Would you, what would so you add? The feature. The, yeah. I, I don't care. I would add more Nikitas. Because <laughs> <laughs> he'll figure out what the cool things are that need to be added. I mean, that's the real limiting factor we have right now, is that it is hard to get started. It is hard to add features uh, without killing everything else, um, and without introducing backward compatibility issues. But I guess to really answer the question, the, the JIT and the fiber stuff is interesting. The fiber and async I.O. combined, if it's done really intelligently, um, I think some really cool things could come out of that. Yeah, yeah that and an API for extensions to hook into that in some way. Yeah. That, that's something we would be more, I would be interesting in doing. With a cool JIT, if it would like this limited, limited resource JIT, you won't need extensions anymore. That's not really <laughs> true. It's not true because you don't want to share resources among requests, and for some database things, you do want to share co connections among requests. Uh, but that's set the f the, there can be an API for that. I mean, we have an API for that. No, ish, we do. That is a different question uh, than the one originally asked with the limitless resources. Okay. Okay. So what am I missing? I, I want the JIT, I want typed arrays, and I want Nikita's AST extension in a standard distribution. Okay. That doesn't take that limit. <laughs> that, that's pretty reasonable, though, the yeah. adding the extension. That's, that's, that's simple very to do. You just have to convince Nikita to to sort of submit to the release schedule of PHP. That's yeah. the only reason he hasn't done it. Yeah, last time I talked to him, he said he wants to clean up the API before. Yeah, he's been saying that for two years, though. I know, I know. <laughs> That's why we need more of them. <laughs> yeah. What about you? Me? Uh, <laughs> what do you guys think? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, I think. No, I meant you. Me? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, you guys, what do you guys think? Any wish, anything on your wish list? Core PHP co uh, functionalities or stuff you like add? No? What's your biggest thing that you would like to see? No? If you can go home. 
<laughs> thinking, thinking. Well, um, you can always talk to them and tell them what you think anytime in the next two days. <laughs> or next, or borrow, or whatever. Yeah, over drinks or something, maybe. Anyway, um, that's all we have. Um, there are so many other questions in there, but, but you know, I have to focus on things that you know, are, can be answered by all, the, all these guys here and then can be um, hard to do that. <laughs> but anyway, um, thank you guys. for You've been a great um, panelist and uh, I think everyone appreciates all your opinions and thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. All right.